This guide and setup will fundamentally change how you approach retopology tasks in the future. In this video, I'm going to uncover all the tricks, preparations and settings I use to retopologize in the games industry. Combined with that, I've made three PDFs for you guys based on retopology. You can download those below. Hi, I'm Virtus. I'm an art director and university lecturer. Welcome to 3D Mutiny, where we buy and sell GPUs for cash. And you'll get that later. So I'm going to show you a breakdown of my full retopology scene and I use this on all my projects and also at the same time if I'm doing any art director stuff I'll send this file out just so everyone can work within the parameters of this. So usually what I like to do we've got a high poly here and a low poly which is basically complete. I like to put different materials on that and one of the features of this high poly is you can see that it's slightly transparent. So there are a couple of settings we're going to go through to get this transparency working correctly and the reason I like to use transparency is that whenever I'm assessing a model or someone sent me a model or if I'm working on myself I actually want to see the underlying low poly also at the same time check the silhouettes of the high poly. So transparency gives us that. So if you see up here, I've got my workspace set to retopology and that's a custom one. You'll usually find default you have UV in general, things like that. So for my setup and this basically works for me, you can customize it depending on how you like. I like to have the layers in the bottom left. So up here, top right, there's a button. You can press this and this opens the layer stack. So we're going to go through why that's useful for retopology. So I like to keep my scene outliner here, which is the list of all the objects containing my low poly and also my high poly guides. You can access this by pressing that button there. Not many people know this, but you can actually come down to the slider here and drag up another instance of the outliner. So that's really useful. Imagine if you have big sets or big groups like this, for example, I can extend the high polys. Now I can keep a list of my high polys there, but maybe I also at the same time want to see my low polys so I can extend this, basically see two instances of it. So you don't have to keep on scrolling up and down the outliner. Also, you can actually right click the outliner and you can press duplicate. So you can have another instance of it. So there's lots of options there. You can also tear these little tabs off so you can have it floating. Maybe it's just off to the side or onto another screen. And then each one of these black bars, you can basically adjust depending on how much real estate you want to take up with the outliner. So setting out your first workspace by default, it's going to look like this. First thing you really want to do is get rid of any unnecessary things. So if you're not using animation for retopology tasks, you can actually drag these off by clicking down here, tear it off into the front and then just use the X to close it. I'd also do it for this one. This is also an animation toolkit. Personally, I don't like being enclosed in this sort of space uh, and the outliner doesn't have to be so large, especially that we know we can split it and also have different instances of it. So a very useful button is the top right here and this is the layer stacks. Now, once that's opened, you'll see a little channel box tab to the side of the window. You just want to click and drag that and I position it in the bottom left. You'll see a little highlighter pop up and that's where it's going to get located. And then just readjust these depending on your preferences. Maybe you don't have too many selection sets or layers. And also we don't make too much of the transformation and primitive options. So we can just make that really small and make the outliner nice and big. Once you're happy with your layout, I would basically come and test it out. So for example, if we just want to be working on the main screen, we can press control and space. This might be your primary method of working in retopology in quad draw. Also test what happens, you know, if we want to minimize the outliner, that's obviously going to make our layers much larger. So that could be useful. And maybe we actually want to hide our layers so we can come to this channel box layer, click that once and it's going to reopen our outliners. So those are different options to switch in between the two. What happens when we come to quad draw? So we could open up this toolkit and then come into quad draw. That obviously makes our screen smaller. So what I take preference on for accessing quad draw is this little button up here. So instead of opening this massive window, you can just press that. Even better than that, if you are using quad tool and say you come out and press Q back to normal Maya mode, you can press Y on the keyboard and that's always going to come back to your last tool. So if you're using quad tool, you can just switch between the two and that's really useful. So combine that with control and space, work on the full screen, and then we can just switch between Maya mode by pressing Q and then come back to quad tool by pressing Y. So once you've tested that layout and you're happy with it, just come to the workspace and this drop down and then come to save current workspace. So that's going to save a file in your default directory and you can also import workspace files. So say you're working at university or another studio, then you can just bring your workspaces with you. So while you're experimenting with that and if it gets a little bit messy, you can always reset the current workspace and then try everything again. So there's settings. We've got something that we can model in. We can do retopology in and then the UV settings. So you can do that for all things. So I'll show you one more tip that I find with the outliner. So if you've got two instances here, by default, you're going to have these top front side and camera perspectives. You really want to get them out the way. So what I do is I just select them all, control G to put
put them in a group. I just renamed them scene cameras. And it basically just pulls them out the way so they're not near the top. And then that means you can scroll these instances quite small and you don't have to keep on scrolling up and down to bypass them. So now you've got your scene set out. It's about changing the color of the objects. So by default, when you bring in a guide and high polys and a low poly, they're all going to be one material. It's going to be very confusing, especially when selecting and, and navigating around this. So like I said at the start, the first one we'll do is the high poly. So select the group of the high poly or press control one. That's going to isolate it. Hold right click over the object and then go to object mode. Now hold right click and then scroll all the way down to the bottom to assign new material. That's going to connect a new material to the assets that we selected. So we see all the high poly objects are selected and in the attribute editor, there's a tab here that says Lambert 5. So open that up and then we've got access to this. I just renamed this like high poly material. You can change the options here, but it's a bit hard with the wireframes to see the color. So close the attribute editor, come up to the hyper shader. It's this little circle. I'm going to bring up this window. So I've got the one I previously had and high poly M. That's the one we just created. You can either click it here to change the settings. A more useful one than that is you can actually click on an object and then this is going to change to whatever material has been applied. So I'd open up this color palette and just change the color to something that works for you. Um, remember that the quad are going to be blue. So ideally you don't want something that's blue because there won't be any contrast there. What I usually go for is like a dull skin tone on my low polys. And then for my high polys, I go for something a little bit more saturated, like a deep green. At any time, remember, you can select all the objects, hover over here and then right click and assign material to the selection. You can also play around with specular colors. I usually like to have this quite low so the highlights aren't interfering with my high poly. I'm just really trying to focus on silhouettes. Now, the important one that I like is transparency. So if you turn this up and just assign a little bit of color to it, it's going to make the guide or the high poly slightly transparent. That's going to help you when you're looking at your low poly, you can see through and it's not sort of like fighting against itself. Now, one important thing to change so you get this nice feature, and it was a question that I saw in one of the YouTube comments, you come up to renderer and in viewport, open up this little box. By default, I believe that the transparency algorithm set to simple or it's either object sorting. So it doesn't work very well for what we're trying to do. I usually set this to depth peeling and I use that for everything. Like if we're doing hair cards, for example. Now, while we're in this menu system, I also like to come down to screen space ambient occlusion. And if I click enable here, now this is going to be more useful on the low poly. It's not really showing on here because we've got a transparent material. So I'm going to select the low poly groups. You'll see why grouping is very useful and then press control one. So when I change the amount and the radius, you'll see that the shadows change. If I untick and tick enable, you'll see the difference. So that's really useful if you want to get an understanding of the 3D object, especially when you're quad drawing, you might not necessarily be able to see that because there's so many layers. So once you've got that high poly or that guide material and also the low poly material, you spend a lot of time on making it really nice. You ideally want to save that out so you can use it on other projects. So if you select the material and then come to file, export selected network, you can save this as a file and put it in the defaults or transfer it to another computer. It's important to change the file type to a Maya ASCII. If in case it's like an FBX, it might not import as a material correctly. So for me, I just keep a folder called Maya kit. And then in there, I have all my materials, my scripts and shelves and custom things. In regards to the materials, I have low poly, high poly, and also something called a cage. So a cage is used for baking. And I'll probably make a video on that in the future. So subscribe or it's already released. So just look in the description. There might be some links there. So we've arranged the scene nicely and we know how to use it. We've also saved the workspace so we can use it in other locations. We've applied different materials so we can discern the different and the guide and the low poly. You've also saved those materials out so you can use them on different projects. So the next section is how to set up your layers, your outliner and all your objects for success. So you're not scrambling around looking for different objects. With the layer system, we can do multiple things. So if I select the high polys and come down to this button here, it's going to assign all my selected objects into a new layer. Double click the layer, then you can rename it. I usually just call it high poly set. Select the low poly and do the same. So I'm going to show you the features with layers layers. And then we're also going to take it one step further, which will help you when it's quad drawing. So the first is when we press V, we can actually hide and show these different layers. So you don't have to mess around with the outliner. Also, what's very useful, say you're coming in here and you're trying to select just low polys. For example, we're just working on low polys for the time being and the high polys there so just as a preview so we can see silhouettes. You can come down to the high poly and then the third button, if you press that a couple of times, means that it's in render mode. And then whenever you select the screen, it's going to click through the high poly and it's going to select all your low poly objects. So it's a really nice combination that you've got this transparent high poly that you don't have to hide all the time. And also you don't have to keep on hiding it so you can select the low poly. So it's always present, but never interfering with your workflow. Basically, you probably also saw at the same time, we have an option that says T and that's basically a wireframe mode. It's not so useful on our guide because there's so much geometry there. It can get confusing, but if we use it in combination with the low poly, it kind of gives us this nice outline where we can see both the high poly. Obviously it's nice and transparent and we can see the wireframes. So, so this is really useful as 
as I'm doing art directorship, I'll receive a lot of low polys and I ask for them to be set up in this manner. So when I press T, I can basically see how the low poly looks and I don't have to scramble around with different layers and materials and setting them up myself, which could waste a lot of time. So really useful for you guys as well. You know, if you're testing your own low polys, you can use this system. Another sort of caveat feature, sometimes it's useful to come up here and then switch your wireframes on with your shading. So that's a bit explosive with the decimation because there's so much information there. If you click this little button here just before the words, you can actually change the colors of the wireframes. So that can be a little bit useful. Um, now we're starting to see the low polys a little bit easier. It's even more useful for the section we're going to move on to next. So another way you can use layers, and it's actually really important for this character because we want to get underneath the head behind the neck and retopologize those areas. It's actually a modular unit. So we're going to be switching pieces out. It's important that the topology works under all circumstances. So we've got the low poly set and the high poly set. So consider this, the objects can exist in multiple layers. So that's really useful. We've got a high poly and a low poly. Now, if we select all the head, both the high poly and the low poly objects, come to this little button to add them to a new layer. We can rename this head. Now what we've got is a useful selection of sets so we can hide the head that hides both the high poly and the low poly. But also at the same time, we keep our low poly and high poly sets. So if I hide that, for example, I can see all the high polys. You can also combine them. So for example, I can hide all the low polys, but then I can also hide the headsets. Now, if you imagine I would set for all my pairs. So for example, the spikes, the low poly and the high poly create a new set called spikes. And then I can just basically hide and show them at the same time. So when you are doing retopology work, professional way of doing it is basically you don't want to use the outliner too much. You want to keep control in your selection sets or the layer system. Those are the secrets for setting up a really cool workspace. And obviously you can customize it yourself. Um, I'm going to release more videos based on GPU caching, link them down in below. Also what we reference with the cage, for example. So if you set up your own workspace that you can use for later, your materials, and you know how to use selection sets to easily manage things like quad draw, leave a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe because I'm going to be releasing more secret unlocks for things like my cage system. At some point, I'll also show you guys how to fully retopologize a creature like this. I think it'll be a good one because there's so many different unique shapes, different layers and systems that can get quite complicated. So sort of like, how do you manage that? So before you go on to the next video, which I suggest would be quad drawing. Hopefully you've got a lot of information about creating your own workspace before you move into quad drawing, saving things like meal materials and how to manage those systems with the layer stacks. If you found it useful, leave a like and also subscribe because I want you to receive all the future videos. I'm going to be releasing a lot of secrets in regards to making game characters, high polys. There's also the 3D Mutiny Discord community. So a lot of people are releasing their artwork and getting feedback for that. I also look there for a lot of video suggestions. So a couple we actually went through today. So if you're still with us and you like free content, go to the 3D Mutiny website website, there's a sign up page there, it's just basically my way of sending you guys free stuff like private videos and free content like base meshes. So thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.